Good morning, Sunday Schoolers. <laughs> I am delighted to have you here for our Sunday School. I'm excited that you have decided to join us this morning and we are gonna get into this good word because we're doing a character study today. I have a great little story for you and then we will start. So let's pray first. <laughs> Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for keeping us safe and giving us the activity of our limbs. Thank you, God, that most of us have awakened and risen with our um, full sense of smell and taste and that we are in our homes and we have purpose and that you're depositing great things into us in this time frame. So I thank you for everything you've done and everything you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So <laughs> I started this video laughing because I woke up, I got everything prepared. Um, I do my studies maybe like a week in advance. God will deposit a word into me and I was looking for a character to study. And so he deposited this word maybe like a week ago and I kind of just left it where it was and let it plant. Um, I left it where it was and watered it a little bit and then um, I think my purpose was just to let it grow and let the Holy Spirit speak in this time frame. So as time went by, I would write notes and things like that. But fast forward to today, I got everything prepared. I got everything set out. I had tried different backgrounds because I wanted a different scenery for you guys here in Sunday school. And um, I was thinking coffee or no coffee. I have water today, <laughs> but I'll do a coffee story as well since we haven't done one in a while. Um, but got everything prepared, did this juicy, juicy word recording. I had everything and, um, my intro, everything ready to go. And then I deleted the video. <laughs> I deleted the video <laughs> with all of the content. So this will be a re-recording which I believe the Holy Spirit speaks in so many different ways, so I'm not worried at all. However, that was some juicy word, and I think that I just needed to get it out, and I think in these time frames when um, God speaks to us, um, sometimes he deposits the word in us first, and then we're able to present it to others. So I just feel like that was my test run. It was a very good test run, so I wish you guys could have saw it. However, I apologize for the delays. With no further ado, we'll go into Coffee with Christ. Now my story about coffee, I'm drinking water this morning because in my region of the United States, it is very hot. So um, I have to stay hydrated. But I usually wake up this chipper in the morning, it's crazy. But by 12, I probably am like ready to go to sleep. Nevertheless, coffee. So with coffee, uh, I've never been like a big coffee connoisseur. However, um, I do get into the taste and the flavors of things, especially flavored coffees. And a friend and I had traveled to Jamaica and they were saying, you have to try this Blue Mountain coffee. You have to try this Blue Mountain coffee. And so I was like, it's, it's coffee. It's just coffee. It's not just coffee. <laughs> I admonish you now that the world has opened back up please get yourself some Blue Mountain Coffee. You can order it. I know shipping may take a little longer, but you can order it. But let's get into the Christ portion of Coffee with Christ. Welcome again. We are coming from the book of Luke. I thought about our character, and our character for today will be the lost son or the prodigal son. It is a parable to, as told by Jesus through the book of Luke from the author Luke. So as we learned in April or May's Sunday School, the premise is to first look at our author, look at the place setting, and then see how we can apply. So our, our author for the book of Luke is Luke, who is a doctor. And doctors, um, doctors normally tell a story based off of the history and the life setting. So Luke is telling a story as a setting for the perfect human, which is Jesus the Christ. We know that Jesus has an artifact and historical backing to prove that he has walked the face of the earth. Um, 
he was crucified and then resurrected on the third day. So that's what we believe as Christians. We also believe that the word of God is written, yes, by human hands, but inspired by God. And the Holy Spirit writes throughout this entire Bible. And you'll see that, especially in this parable today with the lost son. You'll see how the Holy Spirit speaks and how we can apply. But for sake of setting, the um, audience is to the lovers of God or the Gentiles and it is written about 60 AD. Um, Luke is writing from Rome or Caesarea, so that would just be the place of dwelling, um, not necessarily going too far into theories, but it's just his place of dwelling at the time when he's writing these accounts of Jesus Christ. Also, in our Bible, we believe that when the word is written in red, that it is a, um, a parable or story as told directly from the words of Jesus Christ. So when the authors write, they're writing from the accounts of um, others themselves, whatever the case may be, from the standing point of how Jesus told the story. So in this particular story, it's in red. It's all in red because Jesus is telling this parable. And it parallels a lot with what the Holy Spirit and the life brief word is throughout the book of Luke. So to read places so that you get a key understanding and you can have a setting, I'm going to read the key places directly from my study Bible. And my words are kind of small. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read directly from the study Bible, which is huge, but the writing is small. Luke begins his account in the temple in Jerusalem, giving us a background for the birth of John the Baptist, then moves on to the town of Nazareth and the story of Mary chosen to be Jesus' mother. As a, result, um, Caesar, as a result of Caesar's call for a census, Mary and Joseph had to travel to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born in fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus grew up in Nazareth and began his early ministry by being baptized by John and tempted by Satan. Much of his ministry focused on, Gal focused on Galilee. He set up his home in Capernaum and from there he taught through the region throughout the region later he visited Gerasa also called Gadara where he healed a demon possessed man he fed more than 5,000 people with one lunch on the shore of the Sea of Galilee near Bethesda Jesus all, always traveled to Jerusalem for the major festivals and enjoyed visiting friends in nearby Bethany. He healed 10 men with, of, with leprosy on the border of Galilee and Samaria and helped a dishonest tax collector in Jericho turn his life around. The little villages of Bethage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus' resting place were Jesus' resting places in his last days on earth. He was crucified outside of Jerusalem's walls, but he would rise again. Two of Jesus' followers walked along the road leading to Emmaus, where among where they were among the first to see the resurrected Christ. So that's just for setting purposes, so you know. Um, that Jesus is speaking prior to his uh, crucifixion in the last days, what the setting looked like, where he was in life, and the points leading up to his crucifixion, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. So our story comes from Luke 15. The character that we chose for character study today is the prodigal son. If I'm looking down, I'm looking at my notes. The reference scripture is Luke 15, 11 through 32. I will read that scripture in its entirety. And then we're going to break down the um, characteristics of the son, the father, and then some other key references. So let us start again. <laughs> well, for me, start again. Start for you guys the first time. Um, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to, 
to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs through looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He ran to his son. Embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I feel like he was cut off there. Like, at some point, dad was like, mm, get, be easy. Um, but his father said to the servant, that's why I feel like he was cut off, because he said, but. Uh, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf. Um, we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. That's a good word. That's Holy Spirit. He was lost, but now he's found. So, the, so let the party begin. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf? His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but he's now found. Wow. So... <laughs> in that word we um, often look to the prodigal son and that's going to be one of the basis of our character study but I'm going to show you in these verses how everyone plays a role so with the son he's a man with an inheritance no sense of direction or identity and you see that in verse 12 he's asking his dad um, hey I know that I have an inheritance, I have blessings coming to me, and I want them now because I think I could take the reins from here. How often do we tell God, okay, I could take the reins from here, just bring on the blessings, bring forth the blessings, and I'll take it from here. So his father obliged, um, and then he packs his belongings. Subsequently, he goes into town, and he starts to live his life. In verse 13 and 14, he squanders it, doing everything that feels good to the flesh. So when you get those time frames and you're underdeveloped, you you have little, little to no sense of identity, you start to do things that just feel good for the feel-good moment. And so we see that in verse 13 and 14. And... Um, in verse 19, you'll see later that he doesn't even know the sense of who he is in concept to the territory that he has to rule and reign because he's willing to settle. But we move on to the father. Um, the father didn't send, if you notice, he didn't send a search team. So he knew that um, the son had a portion of his inheritance, just a portion 
and he knew this the son would be back it says a lot to the point of how we're reared how we're raised a lot of people say um when you grow up in church or your church kid or whatever the case may be you never really stray away from it and subsequently you'll see singers you'll see people who play in bands and things like that they'll go off and when they're telling their story and their biopic or whatever the case may be they say well, how did you get this soulful sound or how did you learn to play like that well i grew up in church and i played in church and i sang in church it never really leaves you so I, I did notice that the father did not send a search team. He may have worried a little, but he trusted God. So he knew, and he trusted the things that he raised his son on and he reared his son on. He knew his son would be back. And so in verse 20 and 22, some good key points to point out about the father is that he ran to his son. And this is where I feel like the Holy Spirit really speaks and where it's parallel to apply. Because how many times have we went off on our own pathways and then we return back? This is how the Lord God embraces us. He runs to us and he's like, hey, she got it. He got it. He's ready to get back on pathway. Let me go embrace him. Let him know that he is welcome back into the fold because he is family. So. That, I, I believe that that's how God embraces us. And the father ran to the son, embraced him, put rings on his finger, and even cut him off when he was talking nonsense. Because if we look back to verse 19, um, the son is saying at this point that um, I am not worthy to be before you. The son is believing that he was able to talk himself out of every territory that he has in his capacity, in his grasp, by him squandering his portion of his inheritance. And the father was quickened to cut him at the, at the knees with that saying, hey, pause, you are back. You are alive in my eyes. You have come back to life in my eyes. I'm so happy to see you. Let us celebrate you. So he reassured him. And so we move to some other um, key factors is that once you, what you notice about the son is that even when he's in the city, he runs across a man within the city or a farmer and he convinces that farmer at some point, once you, once you get to a limit where you have been squandering the, um, the inheritance, uh, the portion of the inheritance that you've been given. You've been living your own lifestyle or whatever the case may be, and that runs out. Then life tends to happen. Sounds familiar? Famines happen. Random things start to happen. And you are tasked with figuring it out because you decided that you wanted to figure it out from the beginning. So God's like, okay, in my permissive will, I'm going to allow this um, son of mine or daughter of mine to kind of move in their own lane, but I'm also going to allow some things to occur and see how they operate in those things. So even when um, he fell upon a farmer and was able to work for this farmer, he wanted to, in a sense, still gain his independence. And those things breed a sense of like pride, lack of humility, certain things that are being pulled out of you in the sense of your own pathway that you're walking in life. And so um, we would think of the man's character akin to someone who kind of walks along your pathway. I call them God sins because God, um, sends them in the way to kind of buffer some of the um, harsh punishment that maybe sometimes we deserve, the harsh falling and everything like that when we take the train wheels off ourselves and God's like, I didn't want these train wheels to stay on. Um, the farmer is the king to that kind of buffer that comes along the way and kind of gets us back into perspective. So he's working in this farmer's house. He doesn't know this farmer. They never gave him anything. He had to earn everything. And then he got to a point, a lowest point, where he thought that pig slop would be better than what he was going through at the time. He's feeding animals. In that sense, the character of the animals serves as pride. So those are areas in life where we want to um, settle for something just to stay within the purpose that we've created rather than returning to the fold of the inheritance that we already have. So we move over, we move back over to 
the son coming back home, humbling himself and coming back home. And even when he was a far off away, the father saw him and ran to him. That's how God embraces us. Like, come back into the fold. Let us get you back on track. Let us celebrate that you are um, in life and that you are no longer letting these things defeat you. You're no longer moving in your own pathway, but you're letting me take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. You are letting me take the wheel. So let's go back into this pathway. Let's get you back on track. We're happy. We're celebrating. We're going to do this. So he's reassuring the son at this time that everything will be okay. Moving over to the, um, the other son, I feel like when we talk about the lost son or the prodigal son, that seems to be the main character. But if you know about any TV shows you watch, any series you watch, usually the B, the B character, the B side character, or the, um, the supporting role usually has a story of their own. And most of the time, you want to know more about the supporting role story than you do the main character. And that's how you get the development. And so the other son, I feel like the other son plays a... Um, a very key role in that he represents those who have been faithful in the task you've been faithful in your journey you've been faithful in your pathway you've been faithful on your exercise journey you've been faithfully um, staying holy and pure in thought you have been faithful on your job you have the experience but you're not seeing the instant results and in the interim you are um, tasked with participating in the celebration of others so you start to get a tad bit of resentment because it's just kind of like i've been doing the work i have been moving i have been pushing i have been um moving forward in you and you have not shown me as much embrace as you've shown this lost person of yours um who just went off and did what they wanted to do they did everything wrong. I did everything right. And I'm not seeing the results. It sounds among a familiar place. So the other son, that, that's what he represents. That, that, that portion of resentment, that portion of diligence, that seems to be unnoticed. But the father, going back to the father, the father in verse 31, he reassures the son that by saying, hey, you stayed consistent. You've been persistent. You've been on task. So um, as you know, you're not a slave of mine. You've always been my son. You've always been the one that I can trust. And you've had everything at your grasp all along. So it's a perspective shift of sorts. So it's like the father is now reassuring the other son that you've already had all of these things. I am giving your brother an extended portion of everything that you already have. He got one fatted calf. You have my whole flock. You tend, I trust you to tend to my entire flock. I've given you full territory and terrain. You just have to um, stay within purpose and relinquish the control to me. I think that's what God says to us. So some other things, some other key characters within this passage, and I won't be um, here. I won't be before you long. I won't be. <laughs> I won't be here too much longer. But the servants and the bystanders, those are key characters to remember because those are among the uh, the people who are among us that aren't necessarily a sign. They haven't chosen to follow Christ, or um, they have their own set of belief systems those people in real world time are um not necessarily chosen or have a terrain or have an assignment so they're considered servants not necessarily family whereas the son is family and he just doesn't know it the lost son doesn't know it and even the other son doesn't know that he is family they both have an inheritance they have been chosen they have been assigned for certain tasks um we've already discussed that the animal represents pride, lack of humility, those things that we settle for um, when we're trying to do things our own way. So let's say we go out on our own pathway and our own journey of life. Even the lowliest of things may seem satisfying to us so that we can still grasp at doing things our own way rather than relinquishing control. And then um, going back to the farmer, the farmer 
uh, represents uh, the friends and the buffers along the way that kind of pacify us doing things our own way. Meaning they, they serve as a protective boundary from us completely falling away. Um, it's a way to humble us and get us back into the fold. So that is the gist of the character study for the prodigal son. Our reference scripture again is Luke 15, 11 through 32. Um, we normally have our Sunday school, as you know, every third Sunday, and it's supposed to be at 730. Again, I apologize for the delays. We had the juicy version that was deleted. So, <laughs> so here we are here. And um, I hope you were able to gain and grasp knowledge on how to apply a certain parables and certain word frames. This character study in particular being uh, Luke 15, 11 through 32. Um, we would do the base of our study in our Sunday school on third Sunday. And then on first Sunday, we call it our mid-month check. And that's where I'll bring you more reference scriptures. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you have a great and wonderful Sunday. I hope you are loved, blessed, and you're always highly favored. So go forth and prosper in Christ. Thank you.